Davos is an intellectual and economic strategic center of the world. How do we reconcile a globalized society that even the Arab world looks towards with the Imam alayhi salam establishing for himself an independent center? Are the narrations wrong? Or will the Imam ignore the United Nations building? Will the rest of the world look in awe or look in rejection of his governmental location? And again, because we have to see that these narrations are mentioned to us in a context of a questioner and an answer who have their own immediate contexts, it allows us to understand the Mahdian revolution beyond just the text. The text is absolutely correct. The Imam salam, will establish for himself a home, he will establish for himself a government. And the Middle East would certainly be the starting point of his movement. But I don't imagine that the Imam will reject what human community, what the human community has achieved for themselves in bringing about a centralized, respected center of globalized movement. And I think that will actually be an evidence of the Imam's Imamat, that he is able to work with these institutions and help them in achieving what they've always sought to achieve. Imam Ali السلام, during his four years of you know, ruling the Muslim world and being the Caliph, his headquarters were, were, was also Kufa. So the Imam Ali السلام, will continue that. He will establish the seat of his government in Kufa. And that will be the most important city in his world. In fact, one hadith states that people will regret not buying a piece of property in Kufa after the Imam establishes it as his government. Because land prices will be so expensive there due to the high demand that many people will just not be able to afford it. So this is just an indication that it will be a very important city. The Imam Ali Salam will start from Kufa and then he will expand outwards. You know, he will go all the way east to China. He will go all the way west, you know, um, to Palestine and then to, to, to the European continent. And then from there, his government will expand. Now, those 313 companions, some of them will be regional governors. So while the Imam Ali Salam will be the head of this global unified state, there will be regional rulers, uh, rulers and governors. Once the Imam establishes his movement, i.e., that suggests that there will be uh, people with him, there will be uh, a globalized revolution that is taking place from that point. The Imam then has to go about his movement. The narrations are multiple. He will go to Palestine. He will, hadith is very specific. It says, for example, um, he will be very harsh towards the Arabs. Many of the Arab states suggestingly will reject the Mahdian revolution because he will want justice and they're about tyranny and oppression and exploitation, power. So those two things cannot live in the same place. If he tries to bring about a revolution, they will of course likely reject him. As he's going to Palestine, as Sufyani tries to stop the Imam from going, he tries to negotiate with the Imam to stop him from going to Palestine, but the Imam Ali Salam refuses to compromise with the Sufyani. He manages to get to Palestine. The Imam Ali Salam will liberate Palestine, according to our traditions. At that point, it seems the Western world or uh, the Jewish and the Christian worlds now are very concerned about these developments and they try to dispatch their armies to fight the Mahdi. When they see him liberating Palestine, non-Muslim countries will try to get involved. They will organize huge armies to go to Palestine to stop the Imam السلام, from advancing further. The armies go, they reach Palestine. Imagine on one side you have Al Imam Al Mahdi, the savior with his companions. On the other side you have huge, powerful armies to stop the Imam and to fight the Imam. 
it seems that the liberation of Palestine ticks them off. They're disturbed by that. So that's why they have to send their armies. Why does he tab, uh, target Gaza, Palestine? Why does he establish a movement to reclaim Quds? The argument must be this is one of the sources of friction, sources of opposition to the Mahdian movement. And this is wide until today. That certain lobbies from that area are coming out and trying to dispel the idea of the Mahdian movement as being just. What are they saying? They're saying things like Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, they're calling for this Mahdi person. When he comes, he's going to destroy all the Jews. He's going to destroy the, the Middle East. He has to use nuclear weapons to bring about the end times. All of this is nonsense, but all of it is done to discredit the Mahdian revolution in the same way that they discredited, discredited the Muhammadan revolution. Alayhi alayhima. So we have to understand that the Mahdian movement, when he starts going to say, Arabia, when he starts to liberate Arabia, when he starts to liberate Palestine, it is because those are the sources of oppression and sources of financial and media and military oppression and rejection of the true Mahdian revolution. This confrontation that is about to take place between the non-Muslim armies and the army of Imam al-Mahdi Ta'ala Something happens which changes the whole situation there. It's a game changer. Right before the confrontation, suddenly Prophet Isa السلام, descends down to earth in Palestine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Prophet Jesus in Palestine, in Jerusalem, and he addresses the Christian world, the non-Muslim world, who had gathered there to fight the Mahdi. He signals to them that I am Jesus, son of Mary. He will present them signs to demonstrate that he is Jesus and everyone will believe that he will be Jesus. Then everyone's watching. Well, what's happening? Is Jesus here to fight the Mahdi, supporting these non-Muslim armies? What is, he, what is he doing here? When Jesus shocks the world by walking towards the Mahdi, he embraces the Mahdi at the time of Salah. At the time of Salah, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi tells Jesus, come forward. It's the time of Salah. Out of politeness, Al-Imam Al-Mahdi tells Jesus, will you lead the prayer? At that point, Jesus says, no, you lead the prayer because you have a greater right to this. So Al-Imam Al-Mahdi prays and Jesus prays behind him. When the Christian world sees this gesture, most of them join. Prophet Isa السلام, in supporting the Mahdi. If Imam al-Mahdi is leading prayer and Jesus السلام, is also praying, it again raises the question of divinity because again it raises the question as to whom is, is he praying to. If he's praying behind a Muslim figure, it again shows that he has given allegiance to the inheritor of Islam, the Muhammadan religion. Then when he breaks the cross, it doesn't mean that he'll go around breaking every single cross. He will lead that movement to state, I wasn't crucified in this way. Therefore, if you break the centrality of A, his godhood, and B, the cross, forgive my um, uh, very forthcoming statement, what is left in Christianity? The centrality of its pillars of the Trinity and his crucifixion are gone that is taken away, it leaves a huge void in the whole concept of Christianity altogether. And it requires them to rethink the whole notion of God, prophethood, and the role of Jesus Christ. The ascension of Jesus Christ represents a pivotal moment in the uprising of the Imam. His return is an extension of the concept known as the Raj'ah. The Raj'ah refers to the return of a group of people back to this life, prior to the day of resurrection. Allah will permit selected individuals, the enemies of justice and perpetrators of oppression, as well as those who fought for truth and suffered at the hands of injustice, 
to rise from their graves to be witness to the promised justice that will prevail under the divine authority of the Mahdi. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq verifies this notion in chapter 23 verse 87 of the Qur'an which says, And on the day when we will gather from every nation a party from amongst those who rejected our communications, then they shall be formed into groups. Contrary to popular belief, narrations from all schools of thought mention the arrival of the Dajjal after the return of the Mahdi. Though the literature often depicts the Dajjal as a physical figure, contemporary scholars are of the belief that the Dajjal refers to an ideology which will work in opposition to the movement of the Mahdi. سيأتي على الناس زمان لا يعرفون الله ما هو التوحيد حتى يكون خروج الدجال وحتى ينزل عيسى بن مريم من السماء ويقتل الله الدجال على يده ويصلي بهم رجل من أهل البيت اللي هو الإمام الحجة والإمام المهدي عدي الله تعالى فرجه الشريف الملفت للنظر أن أكثر الروايات التي تتحدث على الجداء الدجال تتحدث عن عيسى نزول عيسى كأنما هناك علاقة في الموضوع هاي تحتاج إلى تأمل بس في ظني ربما يكون الدجال كما أورد الشهيد محمد محمد صادق الصدر أن الدجال هي فكرة ليس شخص هي ثقافة هي حضارة ربما وهذا الأمر قد يكون صحيح بنسبة ما لكن لا نستطيع الجزم به لذلك أنا أقول دائما أنه هاي الأخبار التي تتحدث عن المغيبات يحتاج الزمن يبينها بس إحنا نعرف العنوان العام أن ستكون هناك فتنة باسم هذا الدجال هذا الدجال يجب أن لا نفكر أنه شخص عند أو, أو جهة عندها قدرات تفوق القدرات المفترضة في الإمام المهدي عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف أو عندها القدر على التأثير السلبي المانع من انتشار هداية الإمام المهدي هاي الحالة النفسية يجب أن لا تكون لذلك النبي صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم يقول لا أخاف عليكم من فتنة الدجال أو الدجال Without doubt the Mahdi will face both ideological and military opposition This includes the Dajjal as well as many others For this reason the Imam will be forced to launch a series of battles against those who try and sabotage his revolutionary mission the Imam السلام, initially he will not rush to battle. He will invite them. He will address them. He will speak to them. He will show them the truth. He will admonish them to stop, you know, their aggression. But of course, there will be some evil people who will insist on war. And the Imam السلام, at the end of the day will have to defend his global revolution. So there will be a war. Now, how will that war take place? Will it be using conventional old weapons such as the sword or will it be based on modern you know um, technology when it comes to warfare scholars have two opinions over here one opinion of scholars is that the imam alayhi salam will resort to conventional warfare that will be the system in the world so it seems that um, you know modern technology when it comes to warfare will no longer be applicable and there is a reason for that the reason why the imam السلام, might according to this first opinion might go back to traditional methods of combat is because in the religion of islam the prophets and imams as instructed by god they're very sensitive about casualties they don't want any you know, civilian casualties. If you look at modern warfare today, right? A bomb could explode and you could have hundreds of innocent people getting killed in war. One nuclear bomb could obliterate and kill 100,000 people like we saw in Japan, right? In uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now the Imam السلام, does not want that. Only those enemies who have come to kill him only those evil ones who deserve to be, um, you know, uh, battled, the Imam Ali Salam wants to battle them. Well, you can only do that using conventional ways, where it's one-on-one -on -one combat, you know exactly who your target is.